It's critical that we have as clean a air that we breathe as possible because if we are breathing these chemicals often we don't know that we're breathing them and they could be causing chronic damage over time. An estimated 8 million people uh, die because of uh, the harmful effects of air pollution and among these 4.3 million are attributed to household air pollution and 3.7 million are attributed to uh, ambient air pollution. And in Europe, depending on which country you look, uh, we expect that more than two years, uh, three years of life expectancy is shortened due to ambient air pollution. Well, the air we breathe, of course, provides us with the oxygen to live, but also enables us to get rid of toxic products from the body. But if the air is contaminated in any way, then of course the body has to be able to deal with this. This is the basis of air pollution. Air pollution is where particles and chemicals enter through the lung into the body and start to cause tissue damage and make diseases worse. There are large areas in the world where air pollution has got worse in the last 20 years. Typical examples, Asia, Southeast Asia, China, India. So their pollution is not only extremely high, much higher than what we see in Europe these days, but pollution is still deteriorating in many, in many cities, and that is a very, very big concern. In the past, uh, developing countries were more concerned about uh, clean drinking water and uh, improved sanitation. But there has been an epidemiological transition in a major way where this is no longer a big problem. It is unhealthy air that has now uh, become one of the bigger problems in the developing world. According to the latest uh, World Health Organization report that was just published uh, a couple of months ago, the levels of ambient air pollution in most cities in the developing world are extremely high. Just to give you a feel, the set standard for safety for the particulate matter pollution are about 20 micrograms per cubic meter. And in countries like India, most cities in, in, in India, we have levels that are more than 150. Because the lung has to battle against so many environmental insults, having a variety of chemicals to have to deal with on top of everything else really does cause problems. And what we're seeing now is that air pollution interacts with other environmental aspects, particularly virus infections, for example, or even diet and socio-economic circumstances, which sometimes make people more vulnerable to air pollution, to create a background of chronic lung disease. In the developing countries, many women cook using biomass fuel. On a daily basis, they spend about two to four hours uh, cooking food for the family. And during this time, they inhale very high amounts of uh, air pollutants associated with the burning of biomass smoke. It is estimated that they breathe about 25 million liters of highly polluted air during their lifetime. And this has been shown to have a significant harmful effect on the lungs. Women develop uh, COPD, they develop respiratory tract infections, and the risk of developing lung cancers is also high amongst women. The major sources of air pollution in Europe are, of course, the traditional ones for our culture and society, which is traffic, it's industry, it's in general combustion. Of course, we have far less indoor combustion than in, than in developing countries. Across Europe, we're not doing terribly well about air quality. I mean, there are some countries that are taking a lead and taking this very seriously, but actually there are some disparities. But I would say that you know, air does not stay in a country. It does not know a boundary. So you may be having really good activity in one part of Europe, but actually that air is travelling across. So the bad air will be coming into the areas where they're making actions. So you know, we've really got to address this across Europe as a whole. One key thing here that's really important is the disadvantage that 
are affected more than others because they live closer to the roads, they have an inferior diet, so less protection, and generally speaking, they experience greater disease when exposed to pollution. So it really is important now that we take the socio-economic aspects and use this as a powerful tool to argue our case with the governments. So air pollution now has been shown not only to affect individuals as they move around on our earth, but also the pregnant mother. And so if a pregnant mother is exposed to pollutants, some of the chemicals pass through into the developing fetus and influence growth, not just lung growth, but growth of the brain, and sometimes whether the child is born prematurely or not. And these recent findings are operating largely through the way that pollutants interact with the placenta are obviously critical if we're going to produce a healthy generation for the future. We know from the evidence that children living near um, busy roads that their asthma can get worse. We know that patients actually may develop chronic lung diseases because of air quality. So diseases such as uh, COPD and uh, lung cancer, um, and interstitial lung disease, um, occupational um, asthma. So it really should be a concern for everybody working in the field of respiratory disease, but also the public and patients. We have seen, for example, some 15% of all asthma cases in children we would attribute to traffic-related air pollution. Uh, similarly, some 15% of uh, exacerbations of asthma, of hospitalizations, uh, we would um, estimate to be attributable to air pollution. Some 6% of all lung cancer um, in European countries are approximately expected to be associated with ambient air pollution. So in general the, the burden is substantial, uh, much more than one would expect given the level of pollution. And the reason of having such a large burden uh, relates to the fact that everybody, 100% of people, are exposed. We know that people will not reach their life expectancy. Um, they may live with more chronic conditions, um, difficult to control their asthma, um, really just has an impact right across the spectrum. If air pollution is causing a lot of these hospital admissions or making them worse, then we're not helping the patient, we're not helping the health service, and obviously we're not helping the economy of the country. The European standards for particles, for example, the PM10, PM2.5, are far too high. They are not set to protect public health. They are politically set and they are more than twice as high what WHO is proposing. So if we're going to control air pollution, we've got to make it a public health priority. And this is why the public and the physician at large has a responsibility to draw the government's attention to these important aspects because without controlling pollution I can see that we're going to get many of these chronic diseases worsening over the years to come rather than improving. So physicians, A, they need to be made aware themselves about uh, the harmful effects of air pollutants and the growing number of patients that they're seeing in their clinic are likely, are likely because of that. Physicians also need to play an active role in educating their own patients about uh, the harmful effects of air pollutants. When that knowledge comes from a doctor, patients are more likely to accept it and believe in it than when it comes from a third person. Checking somebody's lung function is a fairly simple thing to do as long as people are trained properly. And, you know, we spend our time checking people's blood pressure, um, doing other tests, weighing them, etc. And actually, you know, this is as simple as that and it should be part of the repertoire of um, keeping people healthy and actually identifying people early with lung disease so that they can take um, action at an earlier stage to perhaps um, prevent the rapid deterioration or even perhaps prevent the onset of something more serious. More research is needed to understand the harmful effects of air pollution that is particularly seen in developing countries. So they should contribute to research to generate that knowledge and perhaps that could help in bringing, up, uh, bringing out interventions 
uh, that could be useful for the common man. And I think what we need to try and do within Europe is to take those good countries that are clearly demonstrating improvements in health by the measures they've taken and utilize those to help influence the behavior of others. We absolutely need a strong government who makes the rules and then we will continue to improve air quality. Air quality has very much improved in the last 30 years and we should not stop. We have not done the job. There is still a huge attributable burden associated with air pollution in terms of morbidity and mortality and this can be tackled. The Healthy Lungs for Life campaign is actually a call for action and it's a global call for action. We want to galvanise healthcare professionals, we want to galvanise the public, we want to galvanise people who are responsible for policy, funders, employers, to get behind this and see it as a long journey, not just one campaign. We have developed some fantastic resources for healthcare professionals and they can access those through um, Healthy Lungs for Life website.